This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI signals and sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The first lecture, the block equations and image contrast, is broken down into four parts. Lecture 1C covers hard RF pulses and forced precession. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to distinguish between free and forced precession, differentiate between the RF phase and flip angles, describe an expression for forced precession in the rotating frame without relaxation, write an expression that defines the flip angle. Let's first start by talking about the RF pulse parameters and rules. The RF B1 pulse imparts what we call forced precession, and this is in distinction to free precession, which arises as a consequence of spins being in the presence of the external B0 field. RF pulses have a so-called flip angle, oftentimes called alpha, which measures how far away the bulk magnetization has been perturbed from the z-axis. RF pulses have a phase, oftentimes called theta. A phase of zero degrees indicates an RF pulse rotation about the x-axis, where you use the left-hand rule. So if your thumb points along x, the magnetization curls with your fingers. Or a phase of 90 degrees suggests or indicates a rotation about the y-axis. RF fields induce left-hand rotations, and all B fields do this for positive gamma, whether it's B0, B1, or something else. So we can try these examples to better understand the RF phase. In this case, the RF pulse is indicated with a subscript of zero degrees, so the phase is zero degrees, and the flip angle is 90 degrees. If you align your thumb with a zero degrees axis, which would be the x-axis, then your fingers, fingers will curl the magnetization from its initial state along the z-axis to tip down along the y-axis. Alternately, if the phase is 90 degrees and the RF flip angle is 90 degrees, then we rotate our thumb to point along the y-axis and curling our fingers brings magnetization that was pointed along z to now lie along the minus x-axis. So let's distinguish between free and forced precession in the lab and rotating frames. Free precession without relaxation, which is what we consider right now, the concept of relaxation will be developed in a later lecture. We could describe things in the laboratory frame, which gives rise to the Larmor equation. And this is important uh, because it becomes a fundamental description of bulk magnetization dynamics. Uh, we can also describe free precession in the rotating frame, which was developed at the end of the last lecture, in which case we essentially see that nothing happens because we've demodulated the precessional behavior. Uh, by working in the rotating frame. What's important to us in this lecture is so-called forced precession, again, without introducing the complexity of relaxation at this point. And we'll uh, consider this uh, both in the laboratory frame to show that we end up with a coupled, uh, a complex set of coupled differential equations, and therefore introduce, again, this concept of the rotating frame where, this, where the description of the bulk magnetization dynamics becomes uh, simple or simpler. And so here again, making the distinction between forced precession in the laboratory frame and the rotating frame, uh, all without relaxation. And this makes sense principally in the context of when the relaxation time constants are really long relative to RF pulse events, or the time scale of the RF pulse events is much shorter than the relaxation time constants. And this ends up being, this latter uh, situation here, ends up being a good uh, assumption for many RF pulses. Uh, and helps simplify uh, and provide more intuitive understanding of bulk magnetization dynamics. More generally, we do want to include the effects of relaxation, and that's a concept that's de developed in a later lecture. So in the laboratory frame, we remember that the, the bulk magnetization dynamics are relatively complicated, suggesting both processional behavior and forced precession by the RF pulse, the uh, so-called apparent nutation. Whereas in the rotating frame, of course, this description becomes uh, mathematically simpler and perhaps more intuitive to us. That the bulk magnetization is simply tipping into uh, the transverse plane. So let's examine forced precession in the laboratory frame without relaxation. And this means that our externally applied B field is a superposition of the B0 field and the B1 field. Both of these fields are active at the same time. The B1 field, if it's a circularly polarized RF field, uh, 
can be shown as follows. So it's an envelope function operating on uh, the rotating B1 field. And so we substitute this in as a component of the total external field. If we use this uh, circularly polarized field in, in combination with the externally applied B0 field, then we can write out the equation of motion in the in matrix form uh, as follows. And this gives rise to a set of complex uh, uh, differential equations that are coupled. And so the coupling is apparent because this X component here depends on both Y and Z. The time rate of change of the MY component depends on X and Z. And the time rate of change of the z component depends on both x and y. So this is a relatively complicated set of differential equations. Uh, solutions are possible, but more difficult to obtain. Uh, and I'll show you uh, subsequent to this that working uh, in the rotating frame ends up being easier, both mathematically, and I think it helps provide a more intuitive understanding of what's going on. So we should answer the question, is it simpler in the rotating frame? And you can imagine that the answer will be yes. So let's look again at forced precession in the rotating frame without relaxation. So here we define uh, a, an expression for the circularly polarized RF field. This is in the laboratory frame. So we need to transform this to the rotating frame. Uh, I won't cover the mathematics of doing this in this particular lecture, uh, but those notes are available. Uh, when we define the B1 field in the rotating frame, we get a simpler expression that really depends just on the envelope function and the phase of the RF pulse, and the processional behavior has uh, been demodulated. So now we can define the B effective field. This is, uh, if you will, the apparent B field that the spin system sees in the rotating frame. And as a consequence of uh, adding in both the effects of the B0 field in the rotating frame and the B1 field in the rotating frame, we can see that the B0 field, again, is going to drop out because it's demodulated by this uh, fictitious field term. And we're left simply with uh, the residual of the uh, active B1 field, again, specifically in the rotating frame. So a simpler description uh, at this point of the, uh, of the uh, effective field in the rotating frame. We uh, now consider the simpler case here, uh, just uh, as a thought experiment, when the phase of the RF pulse is zero, in which case this will collapse to just the B1 field pushing along the I hat direction. So let's now substitute in uh, this uh, B effective field into the equation of motion in, in the rotating frame. And we again have two terms here where we've uh, kept the RF phase term, but we have no externally applied B0 field because again, that was demodulated out by working into the rotating frame. So this is an expression for the equation of motion for forced precession, forced precession being uh, arising from the B1 field itself. And again, in the rotating frame in the absence of relaxation. So we can carry out the cross product that's shown here in this uh, determinant operator, and we now get a less complex system of coupled differential equations. Uh, in this case, we have X coupling with Z and Y coupling with Z, and the Z component coupling with X and Y. And we can get at solutions for this system of equations more easily uh, than the system of equations that was shown previously. And so how does this look? Uh, let's start with an initial condition. So the initial condition might, for example, be that the bulk magnetization is pointing simply along the z-axis, in which case the x and y components are zero, and the mz component has the equilibrium level of magnetization, which we denote, denote as m0. Uh, the solution to this set of differential equations, and I won't work through how we arrive at the solution, that's a, a topic of a differential equations course, but what we find is that the mx and my components uh, depend on integrals of the B1 envelope function uh, and then vary as a function of a sort of sine and sine or cosine of the, of the uh, RF phase. And the mz uh, component of the magnetization has a cosine dependence on the integral of the B1 envelope function. So uh, we'll look at some examples of what this means and, and, and how this gives us more insight to uh, the processional behavior of the bulk magnetization uh, during forced precession. Uh, a simple substitution and something that's used commonly is to define the flip angle alpha uh, from this integral expression that's inside uh, the solution to this differential equation. 
And this is a nice expression because it helps us understand how the flip angle of, of the RF pulse is defined. And it's the time integral of the B1 envelope function, uh, which is a, a magnetic field in terms of units, multiplied by the gyromagnetic ratio. So it depends on the species of interest. And the higher in amplitude or the longer in duration, uh, the uh, larger the flip angle will be. So let's consider a very specific example here of hard RF pulses. Uh, hard RF pulses are very short in duration, consequently have high uh, bandwidth. These are generally high in amplitude or can be high in amplitude and consequently might be higher power. Uh, and they're typically played with a weak gradient in the case of trying to excite uh, a thick slab or perhaps no gradient when we're trying to uh, use this as a so-called non-selective uh, RF pulse, so a pulse that just excites everything in a volume of interest, large volume of interest. If we treat the B1 envelope function uh, as a rect function, this would be the mathematical description of an RF pulse that has amplitude B1 that's turned on from an interval uh, at time zero for a fixed or finite interval up to tau RF, the duration of the RF pulse. And we could map that out uh, 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 graphically as follows here. So this is an RF pulse that's turned on to an amplitude B1 and persists for a duration tau RF and then is turned off. And that flip angle, or rather that B1 uh, field, will have an effective uh, flip angle. And depending on the phase of the, uh, that's selected for the RF pulse, uh, we'll have a phase as well. If we uh, integrate uh, this B1 envelope function, this rect function that defines the envelope function for a hard RF pulse, we find that we simply get uh, uh, B1 times time uh, for a time uh, on the interval of zero to tau RF. So this tells us how the, um, how the RF pulse is affecting uh, uh, the bulk magnetization uh, as a function of the duration of the RF pulse. Uh, and here, more simply, we can see that the, that the flip angle alpha simply depends on the gyromagnetic ratio, the amplitude of that hard, hard RF pulse, and the total duration of the pulse. And the product of these three terms will give you the total flip angle uh, exerted by this RF pulse. So how do we design, say, the fastest hard, off pul hard, the fastest hard RF pulse? Uh, typically, we're interested in fast pulses uh, so that we can be time efficient for our scans. We begin, for, uh, uh, for example, by specifying the flip angle. Uh, this might be in radians in the example I'm showing, or it could be in degrees. We might wanna use the maximum available B1 uh, of the system, uh, which is typically sort of tens of microseconds. And this will help us evaluate what's the shortest possible pulse duration. And so here we can rearrange the expression shown on the previous page. We define, say, a flip angle of pi over two or 90 degrees substitute in uh, the appropriate gyromagnetic ratio uh, and uh, assuming a B1 max of 25 microtesla, we'd find that this RF pulse would be about 245 microseconds in duration. So quite short RF pulse uh, to tip the magnetization a complete 90 degrees. So we've discussed free and forced precession in the lab in rotating frames. Uh, we're essentially going to leave behind the laboratory frame because it's not uh, as intuitive for describing what's happening to the bulk magnetization dynamics. We've looked at free and forced precession. Here we uh, examine forced precession in the absence of relaxation and specifically in the rotating frame, which gives us a simple description of RF pulses and a simple description of the bulk magnetization uh, dynamics uh, during an RF pulse. Um, and again, this has all been treated without, the, uh, without relaxation. And so we think of this as being the time scale of the event, the time scale of the RF pulse being much shorter than relaxation time constants. And we'll describe in a subsequent lecture more about relaxation and introduce the possibility of having relaxation while also um, uh, imparting free or forced precession. So what about the return to equilibrium? Here we've described how RF pulses can perturb the bulk magnetization away from the equilibrium uh, position. Uh, and in that context, it'll be important to, to describe how does the bulk magnetization relax? And for that, we'll turn to the next lecture. You can click the links below uh, to learn more about the effects of relaxation.